Hi, I'm Jeff. Not even going to try to pronounce that last name. Just kidding. We say Tigelar, though it's much sloppier in the original Dutch. But I'm excited to be able to um, talk with you today about writing and read some poems with you. Uh, but first, I really want to thank the Lakewood Public Library for this opportunity, especially the director, James Crawford, for reaching out and Andrea Fisher for helping make it happen. Uh, I'm very grateful. So I live just across the river here in Huntington, West Virginia, where I work at the Cabell County Public Library. But I used to live in Ohio. Um, hold that thought for just a second because recently I stumbled onto an interview with the poet Denise Duhamel, contemporary poet, I should say, um, Denise de Hamel, who said, in fourth grade, I had no idea contemporary poets existed. I had a sense that all poets were dead, that no one wrote poems anymore, just as no one still made their own shoes. And I remember feeling the same way when I thought poetry, I thought Wordsworth, romantic, nothing against that stuff, but eh. Uh, so back to Ohio, or the road to Ohio. Um, shortly before I was about to move to Athens, um, my wife got into grad school at Ohio University uh, in English, and I was in a bookstore in Grand Rapids, Michigan, looking through one of those uh, best American poetry anthologies. And I found a poem I really liked. Um, and I was reading the bio in the back and I saw that the author was from Ohio and from Athens and taught at Ohio University in the English department, same department that my wife was gonna be a part of. Um, and so this was a poet, a, a, a living, breathing poet that I'd probably get to meet in just a matter of days, um, which was cool and interesting. And um, what struck me was that his work was actually fun to read and it dealt with everyday stuff and I understood it. Um, so in fact, um, let's see. A line from his book, Losers Dream On, um, which he hadn't written yet, but he didn't know that at the time, of course. Um, yes. That's the poet's name. Uh, and the line is, uh, you live in the life you have and you try to be awake. And that's, that's something I think that I try to do with the poems I write, which I will read to you soon um, or actually how about now um, let's see yeah I should talk about the book a little bit first it's called certain streets at an uncertain hour uh, published by Woodley Press Washburn University Topeka Kansas we were living in Kansas at the time and um, so two kind of stories behind the book. Um, one is good, one's not that good. Um, so Kansas at the time w became the only state uh, to not have an arts council. Um, I, the governor at the time decided that a good way to save money would be to just cut, cut the arts. Don't need, don't need funding for that business. Um, and so I thought, you know, a lot of people thought that, that no time, no better time to, you know, make art. Um, and so, and then uh, the illustrator, this book is, uh, you'll notice illustrations on the cover and all through the inside, I'll show you a few. Um, Charlotte Pemberton is the, the illustrator's name, in case you can't see it. There we go. Um, look, there's Kansas. Um, Charlotte's kids uh, went to the same school as my kids, 
and she found out that I wrote and had a, a, a poetry manuscript um, that wasn't even published yet. It was accepted for publication, but she asked to read the poems. Uh, who does that, you know? And so she read my, my whole unpublished book and she returned the manuscript with drawings and they were good drawings and um, just like whatever poem kind of uh, resonated with her she would do a drawing for um, and I asked her if she she wouldn't mind doing more or actually I I emailed the publisher and asked if it would be okay if drawings went along with the book and they said that that was fine so um, next thing you know let's see I should show you these drawings. Uh, we've got a wheat field there. A book. Let's see. My favorite is uh, this hay bale. Um, probably my one of my favorite lines of the book. Um, it says, uh, let's see, it's from the, the poem Day Notes, Lawrence, Kansas, 2012 through 13. Um, Ran out into a field and punched a hay bale. Um, well, there's more to it than that. Uh, the next stanza is, um, was out for a jog and saw it sitting there and thought, if I go punch that hay bale, at least I'll be able to say I punched a hay bale. Um, and here we have the hay bale. Here we have a, a partially eaten pizza from the poem. Uh, all that's happened since Kristen spilled beer on our carpet which, um, in all fairness, I don't think Kristen ever did spill beer on the carpet, but uh, she did move away. Um, why don't I actually read a poem? Um, this one is called Least Weasel, Mustela Nivalis, Natural History Museum, University of Kansas. I'm right there with you, little guy. Sometimes I feel like you, the smallest carnivore in the world. Poor fella, I say aloud to the critter encased in glass. It's Monday. No one's around. So really, it's okay that I'm conversing with a tiny stuffed mammal. I tell him there's something somewhere in the Bible on the least being first, or maybe it's the last being first and the least being blessed. Either way, it's good news for us. But then further down... On my little friend's placard, I read this bit of information. The least weasel is known to take on much larger creatures, the cotton rat, for example, by wrapping its legs around the prey and delivering a swift bite at the base of the skull. Least weasels, it seems, don't need pep talks from the likes of me. I turn to leave but as I walk, I find I've got this sudden new resolve. I exit the building and look for something big. There's the weasel, another of my favorite drawings. Let's see. All right. Oh, uh, I should, they like, People to talk about, um, you know, the question how and or when did you become a writer or a poet? Um, so I'm going to just brief interlude before I read a few more poems. Um, the typical answer to that might be like, you know, when I, you got your first first piece published. Um, but when I really thought about it, it I think it went further back, way further back to kindergarten where uh, my teacher uh, Mrs. Padding P-A-D-D-I-N-G like as in softness which is the perfect name for a kindergarten teacher right um, on St. Patrick's Day she had the class vote on whether for the day she would be uh, Mrs. O. Padding or Mrs. Mick Padding for the day um, and the class voted 
and everyone voted the same way except for me. Uh, it, it was like 29 to 1, and I, they all, everyone else voted the wrong way. I was just very disgusted and, and disillusioned, um, and I, I still remember that uh, to this day. It really stuck with me. So, um, oh, what's that? Oh, yeah, they, ch they chose um, O-Padding, Mrs. O-Padding. And for me, it was, I mean, clearly Mrs. McPadding. Um, at the time, I think it was just, you know, uh, intuition or instinct. Uh, and, but now if I really uh, scrutinize it, I think it was the, maybe the M repetition and the I sound, Mrs. McPadding. Um, no big deal, though. Um, I, I got over that, I'm sure. Uh, so, and then the next uh, maybe inclination for for my poetic leanings, um, I think was fourth or fifth grade. I had a poem published in uh, maybe the classroom newsletter, or, or maybe that's an over glorification. I think it was just a class assignment, but. Um, and my poem was um, about Jello, and I still remember the the opening line or stanza. It was Jello, Jello, you're a good fellow. You wriggle and jiggle and squiggle, I think, or wiggle, squiggle and jiggle. Um, so, yeah, it, it was um, that, that stuck with me. So there must have been something to that uh, that Jello poem. Um, but I think what cemented it was um, my, my first poem uh, published was um, about uh, edible underpants uh, in a journal called Harper Palette in 2007. And it was the first place I sent that poem. They accepted it. Um, so it was a beginner's luck kind of thing. Um, and they say, you know, you have to send out 99 pieces to get one published and I thought I was, you know, good to go. But um, I think I did get about like, you know, 90 something rejections after that point. Um, but it helped. I think they had a uh, call for food poems. Um, it was actually it it came with a uh, an edible poem by Cole Swenson. Um, and it was for the, the food, hunger, and appetite issue. And this is the, the edible poem insert. I, I haven't eaten it yet. Um, let's see. Eat our words. Only the poem inside is edible. Outside label and envelope not suitable for consumption. Uh, ingredients include potato, water, vegetable oil, F, D, and C, yellow, red, blue, all that. Anyways, um, the poem is called Late Snack. And I suppose if you really want to read it, you could pause your screen and um, yeah, and it's, it's not what you're thinking. Anyways, let's see. I may be very far off track at this point, but let's, let's get back. Um, let's see. So, uh, yeah, I've established that, you know, um, I was, it was destined to become a, a, a poet from a young age with the, the opatting debacle, um, and so I guess I guess you could look at uh, my my journey to poet was maybe a kind of series of ascents and descents, sometimes both at the same time. Like with writing about edible undergarments, um, but in a very uh, artful, tasteful way. Um, I hope. Um, I should get back on script here. Um, Back to the, back to the poems. Uh, let's see. Okay, this is called the thing about dying. Today on a remote trail, I encountered a man, and as we were passing, he said, "Beautiful morning," and I said, "Yes, it is." And he said, "I bet you didn't think you'd die today." And I said, no, I didn't, but it would happen this way, wouldn't it? But he didn't really say the thing about dying. That part was only in my head. What he actually said was, it's my first time out here. I'm Keith. 
To which I replied, Ah, nice. I'm Jeff. Second time. Great spot. Enjoy the trail. Keith was very smiley and heavy set with a white beard and a golden retriever who was just as smiley as Keith and who should have been on a leash, but oh well. This was called Animals Were Looking at Me. One neat thing about where I live in Kansas is that you can turn north off 6th, just past the Walmart and the strip malls, go about half a mile, round a bend, take a left, turn into the dirt lot with the Martin Park sign, get out and walk a quarter mile on the path, and all of a sudden you come out on this rural road and you're totally in the country, which you can tell because animals are looking right at you. Geese, a goat, a white horse with some sort of jacket, a little donkey, an alpaca. It's the strangest kind of eye contact, and it's impossibly quiet. But then a leashless pit bull comes charging and only stops when called by its owner from the window of a trailer. And soon you'll begin, I'll begin, breathing again. And the dog, dejected, will amble home and I'll unfreeze and keep walking, the horse having now turned its back, the alpaca now rolling on the ground, no longer interested in me. All right. A lot of animal poems I'm noticing. And here's a little drawing of a, of a, a possum. I'm not going to read the opossum poem uh, because it's called uh, Dude, You Killed a Marsupial and it involves possum death. Don't want to go there. There's one about... Uh, Baseball player George Bretz, he lost his labradoodle, called on the community to help him find it. Let's see. I'll read one more from this book, and uh, it's called There's This Thing. I'm going to take a drink of water real quick. There's this thing, and I don't know what it is, but I haul it all around because it's attached to my hand. There's this cloth that's wrapped tight around my arm, bright orange cloth all the way past my elbow and affixed to some mesh wiring, a lot of mesh wiring. I have to drag it behind me. It's like I've got a giant mesh wire cage arm. Sometimes I turn around and I'm like, oh God, what the, all these years and still it catches me off guard. It gives me some leeway in crowds, at least. The cage is teardrop-shaped and large enough to house, and does in fact house, a five-foot, oh, how should I say it, starfish squid, as if there were some better way. Sometimes when I feel whimsical, I twirl it, my starfish squid, just spin and spin and give it the sensation of flight. But I know what that thing really needs is water. And, um, no, there's no picture, but there's a little inscription. It says, after Damia Smith, catharsis, steel, cotton, beeswax, Kansas University, metal smithing, jewelry, 2013. I think it was uh, something I saw in, a, in an art gallery. And um, that was the resulting poem. Next page, we have a jackalope. There's a, there's a jackalope-based poem. Um, oh, look, here's a cicada. Love that one as well. Great drawing, Charlotte. Cicadas are everywhere, aren't they? But then, randomly, Charlotte was um, inspired to try to draw the dentures from a denture-related poem. Um, another bug. The Capitol Dome. And look, there, at the last page, there's, there's the alpaca. Um, all right, I should wrap things up. Um, let's see. Oh, my final two poems both have Ohio references um, for you all, for you Ohioans, or references to the Ohio River at least. Uh, this is called Group with Strings. At the river, a red balloon floats above and past me, 
drifting over the Ohio now, headed now for Ohio, the Ohio, state where my daughter and son first lived, then a blue one, or is it purple? Signs, either way, these balloons, maybe I'm in the right place. Then a whole group of them, dozens, a hundred, more the next time I look up. So I turn and check to see about their origins. Where are you from, you flocking balloons? How high will you get and how far in this life? And will you remember your Huntington days? The things you found here, everything you left? There's a group of people on a hilltop. Some are in dresses, most of them aren't. They stand and watch. What have we done? I think about whether it's littering, but then I let it go. Everything's fine when it stays afloat. One of the balloons was a golden star. Most were hearts. And finally, mannequin in the river, Huntington, West Virginia. It caused some alarm, yes, panic and response. Before it proved plastic, it was definitely the body of a man, or a woman, certainly, certainly. Just floating past town, drifting down the mighty Ohio. Citizens were involved. The law, state police, two fire departments, the swift water rescue team, a chopper, a boat, a barge redirected. A lieutenant cut short a rare talk with his son. Keith, I gotta go, he said. A driver on the bridge to Ohio looked down and to his right a beat too long and had to slam the brakes. It wrenched his lower back and so much for that Pepsi Brenda cracked open and set on the console before twisting and reaching to fix Liam's car seat, the belt of which the boy had been insisting was way, 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 way too tight. What the hell was going on below? Eventually, everyone was relieved it was a dummy, but also kind of annoyed, you know. Um... I forgot to show you, uh, that, that's the only poem, or the first poem I've ever written that uses the word Brended. Um, I don't know why I told you that, just to clarify, I guess. Um, so, I guess um, some, some of the things that these poems had in common, I noticed, besides the animals, was that they're all kind of a form of response. Um, maybe to uh, a museum exhibit, natural history uh, display, a uh, piece of art, uh, a piece of litter on the ground, um, or a news article about a mannequin. Uh, so what can you respond to, I guess I would want to ask, um, and how? And I would suggest uh, keep an eye out, be awake and aware, trust your intuition, um, if something stands out to you or if something pulls or nudges you, maybe follow it. Um, see where it leads. Um, but until then, thanks for being here and being receptive. Um, and if you're interested in a copy of the book, you can email me and name the price. It's yours. And thanks again to Lakewood Public Library.